Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, will our children ever be able to afford to live in Hawaii? Aloha and welcome. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Hawaii consistently ranks among the most expensive places to live in the country, but our median salaries are barely above the national average. What's the chance we can turn things around to make Hawaii affordable for our future generations? Tonight, will our children ever be able to afford to live in Hawaii? Join our conversation tonight by calling 973-1000 if you live on Oahu or 800-238-4847 if you live on a neighbor island. You can also visit pbshawaii.org on your smartphone, tablet, or computer to join the live discussion or find us on Twitter at PBS Hawaii. Insights is also live streamed at pbshawaii.org. Now to our panel. Sumner LaCroix is an economics professor and fellow for the Economic Research Organization at the University of Hawaii, also known as UHERO. Jack Legal is the current president of the Honolulu Board of Realtors. He's the owner of Legal Realty in Kapolei. Kerry Larger is the director for the Career and Post-High Counseling and Guidance Department at Kamehameha Schools. And Eric Gill is the financial secretary treasurer of Unite Here Local 5, Hawaii's Hospitality and Healthcare Workers Union. Let me start with you, Gary. And, uh, Gary, <laughs> right off the bat, I mixed you up with Let me brother. make a call. Huh? <laughs> I did the same thing with uh, Brian Schott's brother over and over again, I apologize. But we're talking about the future of, of affordability in Hawaii, but can our kids even afford Hawaii now? Uh, well, many of them can't because they leave. And uh, if you want to get a house, uh, and not have to, you know, work three jobs to do it. You leave, and uh, it's a function of high housing costs and generally a, a service economy with generally low wages. Uh, you know, we've done very well in terms of our union members. We've delivered the third highest uh, standard of wages and benefits in the country after New York and after San Francisco. And our wages will probably pass San Francisco in the next few years uh, under the current contract. So we've done a very good job in terms of, uh, on behalf of the community, in the uh, hospitality industry. exacting, exacting uh, good money for local people in their jobs from an industry that's booming and making a huge amount of money and uh, not you know one of the challenges we face is that our industry is no longer run by hoteliers or people who are interested in running hotels it's run by excuse me uh, real estate uh, real estate people who are into buying and selling property we were going to get into that a little bit more a little bit later too about the causes of our high cost of living uh, Carrie Larger um, you deal quite a bit with students and older folks what kind of Way, how are people coping with the, what things cost here? You know, for some of our young, younger keiki, what we're trying to do is prepare them for the real world. And with preparation comes access to different types of resources, as well as for our older students. It's a matter of knowing what's out there to help them get the education, because we know education gets you farther in terms of the kind of earnings that they would need in order to stay here in Hawaii. Let me ask though, uh, how are they getting by, young people that you're in contact with? How are they managing to afford to be here? Well, we look at the families and we also work with the students. So it's a matter of understanding what the students' desires are in terms of their interest, as well as connecting them to the salaries that they'll make with the kind of career decisions that they're thinking about. So we show them the realities of what's in their future to help them make an informed decision. You know, uh, Jack Legal, uh, in the real estate business, you probably see families all the time struggling to try and afford, say, a $700,000 house. Yeah. How, how are people coping? How are they managing to afford real estate? Uh, it's really difficult. You know, like, um, we know that our economy is growing, and um, apparently unemployment is low, but I think the, uh, the salary, as uh, Eric was saying, is not keeping up with uh, the the, uh, the prices, uh, the high cost of living, especially the cost of owning a home. And so I think what's happening is um, our kids or the kids, the children are mostly living with their family. And if they want to buy a home, 
their family has to help them, either with uh, you know trying to co-sign for the loan or give them um, uh, money for down payment. Just like my, uh, my colleague, um, her uh, children are back in the mainland and they want to come home. Or her daughter was trying to buy a house, um, but they don't have enough money to buy a market home property, so they have to co-sign for them. The problem really is um, <clears throat> they're making enough money that they won't qualify for the affordable homes, and yet they don't make enough money to qualify for the market property. So they're kind of a gap, you know. Mm -hmm. So unless the parents have this financial flexibility, uh, children are just gonna not be able to, 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 you know, to survive or to live or even own a house. Okay, Senator LaCroix, I understand that you've been looking specifically at this question and you might have some uh, graphics to help us through it. Right, so I brought, I brought three graphics to try to give us a bit of a handle on uh, uh, the prices of single family homes in Hawaii. Okay, we can and, see those. Um, so the first graphic shows the prices of single family homes um, uh, in the, on the four major uh, counties. And one of the things that's just really notable is the tremendous increase overall uh, in the price of single family homes over the period 1998 to today. Um, you know, today a single family home in Oahu goes for about $650,000. Um, that's a tremendous amount of money. Um, takes large down payments to be able to afford um, a good amount of income to be able to um, to service it. Most <laughs> island families cannot afford to buy the median home. Um, it's not just true. It's not just true in Honolulu. It's also true for families in Maui, um, where the prices are over five hundred thousand. It's true for f families on Kauai, where the prices are over five hundred thousand. It's a little bit cheaper on the Big Island. Now, the second graphic you wanted to talk about is that new housing units authorized. Why is this important? The new housing units authorized is important because we've we've really reduced the amount of housing that we're building um, in the state. Um, if we look at that period, two thousand up to about two thousand six. Um, right before the start of the Great Recession, we built approximately 6,000 units per year in the state. And since then, that's dropped to about 3,000 units. Um, and at 3,000 units, it's just not enough to keep up with demand. Um, in this case, it really is simple supply and demand. Um, that what we found is that demand has been increasing somewhat for a variety of factories, but the supply is not keeping up. Um, again, if we're only gonna build 3,000 per year, um, we're going to find that prices are going to continue to escalate. Uh, University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization <coughs> estimates that if we don't build more housing by the year 2017, we'll have prices close to 800,000 um, on the island of Oahu. And that brings up to the last graphic, which is about whether people uh, can actually afford these houses. And so uh, why don't we take a look at that one? Okay, so the last graphic um, lists real per capita personal income. Okay, so this is per person income. We've, we've adjusted for inflation That's the over yellow time. line. Um, and so, if you, that's the yellow line, and if you look at it back in 1989, it's about $41,000. And if you look at it today, it's about $46,000, okay? That's a period of about 25 years, roughly, where it's, real income has only gone up by a little more than 10%. That's not much, you know? It's, it's really a small amount for a 25-year period. And last but not least, contrast that with the first 25 years after statehood, uh, then real income rose about 4% per year. Okay, now we got tremendous growth over that period, 19, 1958, <laughs> all the way through, all the way through the end of the 1980s. So we and have since a, then the economy has really stagnated. So we, we've got basically wages going up at this rate and housing going up at this rate. Is that fair? That's correct. Uh, Eric Gill, um, what about your members in terms of the the stories they're telling you? Is even, even with, you know, as you you're saying, you know, comparatively higher salaries, they're dealing with this incredible high cost of housing. How how do they cope? Well, many of mem my members do uh, buy homes, but they do that by having multiple families living in the home. So we've got members where you have an entire family in one bedroom and another in the next and another in the next in order to make the note and be able to live there. Um, and that's my members who, you know, we, we, we deliver wages that are well above the national average for the hotel industry, um, but the other hotels that are not represented by Local 5 no longer keep up. It used to be that when we would get a raise, the non-union hotels would try to match it. That has stopped uh, in the last 10 years, and uh, the, the gap has, has grown to, you know, in terms of a total package, uh, over $10 an hour. So a hotel worker in a, in a union hotel would have a decent chance to buy a home. Hotel workers across the street in a non-union hotel uh, live in sometimes very terrible conditions. Let me understand, though. So what you're saying is that overall, 
as, as much as your union may have been successful, you're seeing the rest of the economy not even keeping up with you and even falling. And it's going to get worse. You know, Oahu right now is the is the ground the ground zero for a, a huge influx of capital, and this is invest in investment capital that's coming here to Oahu, because real estate prices in Oahu basically hold their value, and stocks. You know, nobody. You know, it's very volatile, very risky. Bonds. You're not making any money. Uh, there's very few good investments out there for these uh, huge corporations. So they're into real estate buying and selling and what that does is it forces the cost of the property up and up you know for example we're organizing the workers at the Aston Waikiki right now that hotel was sold twice in the last two years and each time each time another increment of price goes on there each time the debt service goes up and that what the, and what that does is it encourages the uh, the owners to reduce staff and reduce jobs and reduce hours to to make up the difference Jack Legal is uh, representing the, the the realtors of this uh, state are you seeing a tremendous amount of money coming from offshore and, and investing in real estate and forcing up prices? Yeah, I think that that's really the, uh, it, it begs the question, like, um, you know, we're building, but a lot of times the, uh, the, uh, we're building for investors, outside investors. Uh, for example, Kaka'ako, you know, let's take a Kaka'ako. Kaka'ako is supposed to be affordable. And, uh, but what they're doing is they're building a lot of condominiums for those who are uh, luxury condominiums for those uh, outside investors who will be owning this property. So again, we're talking about supposed to be affordable homes where people can live there, like uh, your workers, you know, people who work in the hotel. The, the only, uh, as of now, the only affordable apartment there or building is the Hale Kavaela with 204 units, and those are rentals, you know. And the rentals over there are taxi drivers, uh, hotel workers, small business owners. And when they build this place, uh, 204 units, 700 applicants mm -hmm. were lining up, you know. Senator LaCroix, yeah. so is this the explanation for the, the last graphic you showed us, that, you know, here's our wages are going here, but something's driving the price of, of housing up so dramatically. Is it the outside money coming in? Um, you know, it's, it's also worth remembering that this conversation that we're having about housing costs um, Not new. Uh, and, and, and salary stagnating, this could be had in so many cities around the United States. Okay, This could be had in Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Los Angeles. These are all places where um, salaries have not been rising at a very high rate and housing costs have been, have been soaring. And so one of, the, one of the things really to ask is why have, why have the housing costs been soaring? One is the amount of regulation that's being applied um, mm. to the housing industry. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's become extremely difficult to develop an area in housing. Um, Coa Ridge, whatever we think of Coa Ridge, I mean, there's, there's people who are, who are against it and are for it. Um, it's certainly taken Cass and Click a long time from beginning the Coa Ridge project to trying to bring it to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, all of those costs over a very long period of time make it very difficult and expensive to build housing in, in Hawaii. Um, this, is all, this is also true on the mainland. Uh, regulation of, house, of building housing inside major cities has, has, has become very onerous in a, lot of, in a lot of big cities in the West Coast. The same conversations could be had there. Um, there's people too who, who already have their piece of the pie and they certainly don't want to see much more of the island um, uh, be developed. Um, you know, there's, there's really, I think, one of the conversations we need to have more of on Oahu are really, is really green field development versus development inside the urban core. Um, it's one thing to talk about the specific development inside Kaka'ako. It would still be nice to see more of a conversation about the redevelopment of other neighborhoods on Oahu besides, besides, well, besides Kaka'ako. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing, too, is that our keiki are coming up with this bleak kind of uh, environment, but how do we prepare them for that saving to teach them how to save, right? Uh, and also, with the education that they're going to get, how is it affordable to go to college, right? So there's all these resources and there's this latter approach. Uh, depending where you're at, and if you're in a high school or if you're in college already, there's different stepping stones to get to the salary and the incomes you want to achieve. So if you need a short-term certificate just to, to survive, that's what you'll do. And then you can always go back uh, to get a higher degree so that the marketability of what you can provide to Hawaii becomes 
the place where you can start earning that higher living. That's what we teach our students. To. What, I, what I'm curious is to when you speak with your, these the families that you're you're dealing with is is the price of housing like highest among their concerns about the future? It's housing, it's daycare, it, it's all of those costs that a family needs to think about. So we try to look at it piecemeal in terms of can you go to college for a semester? How can we pull upon the community-based organizations mm -hmm. to help students get through each semester to get to their end goal? Because it's all about short-term goals to the long-term investment that you're trying. And a lot of times, uh, some people may not have the persistence and perseverance to wait, but we try to carve it out in steps rather than looking four or five years out. But looking four or five years out requires money. And so we have to plan in that way, but show them in increments. Let me. Uh honor our uh, our viewers we're getting quite a number of calls and I'm backing up over here um, but uh, to go into the next phase of our discussion what is the number one factor affecting the cost of living is it the cost of housing or is it something else uh, Senator LaCroix what, what is your feeling well, we've, we have a lot of things that are expensive here utilities have been expensive part of that's been the run-up in the cost of oil um, over the last few years and then we, we we're finding that electricity costs are starting to come down a bit uh, partly because the price of oil has come down substantially. Gasoline was a big contributor to the increase in the cost of living here. Again, that's starting to come down, um, um, and we're, we're, we're likely to see that contribute to a bit of a stabilization of the cost of living. Water rates have gone up a lot. Um, that may not be such a bad thing. We've been using up the aquifer. Um, we need to do more conservation. The higher rates are likely to lead to that, but for a household, uh, the, higher wa the higher water rates are also a burden. Uh, sewer rates have also gone up. Okay. Yes. And the price of food. Of course, we have the highest food prices in the country. Um, there's really just there's really no getting around that. We have extremely high food prices, and this is nothing new. You know, we've had high we had high food prices in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. I mean, that, th those have continued. Those have continued. We've through had today. high food prices because we had no agriculture for local consumption, and now we're right. developing mm -hmm. our farmlands. And uh, I would just point out one thing. It's like we've we've had a massive withdrawal of units from the housing inventory. You know, the HTA did a study and came up with, you know, between 23 and 26,000 units being marketed at, on the internet as vacation rentals. But and those yeah. those units, many many of them would have been residences had they not been done there. And you can make a lot more money renting to tourists for vacation rentals than you can make by renting to local people to live. And uh, we've that's what's that's what's happening now. We got we've got construction in Kakaako, which is being built for outside investors. What are they going to do? They're going to leave it dark, or they're going to rent it out as a vacation rental? That's sucking jobs out of our hotels, which further exacerbates the, the problem of income into the co community while raising the, the price of housing, not just here, but everywhere. New York, for example, they've gone from Airbnb from about 2,000 to something like 70,000 units in, in two years. And so these are units being withdrawn from, from the housing market for local people and being divert, di, you know, basically di, um, diverted. diverted toward what, what happens to be you know, illegal hotel operations in residential neighborhoods, not with, the, not with the tourist tax, not with the general excise tax. There's a lot of skating going on, and this is happening all over the country. And it is contributing to the housing costs in every major city, uh, and, it's, and it's skewing the development for, for development of units for the local market to development of the units for a tourist market. Jack, do you, Jack Lickle, do you see this, that same, that same uh, phenomenon uh, as a realtor? I certainly do, yeah. Uh, just to piggyback on what uh, Gary was saying is that uh, because, <laughs> we are, I so okay. finally agree with him. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's too cost, yeah, just too cost, man, you know, <laughs> like, okay. So what I'm saying He's is, more upset uh, about uh, it than me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what's happening is, I think, as you said, the, the, the apartments that's being built in Kakako are being geared toward outside investors because then this will become investors. And the, this is what they call like a shadow apartment. Uh, inventory. Let me ask a quick yeah. question. This comes from uh, one of our viewers. Um, homeowners have a bigger influence on home prices than is generally acknowledged. Uh, please discuss. I, th I think what this caller is suggesting is that 
when you own a home, you, you want to get the highest price you can, the highest value. If that means renting out a room or renting it out as a and b you'll do that. Well, as the doctor was saying there, it's a, it's a question of uh, supply and demand. You know, with, uh, when there's no, when the, when the demand is high and the supply is not there, so it becomes like a seller is a market. So the seller can pretty much demand their price and that, you know, that jacks up the prices that we have. And when that happens, then you have the, uh, you know, the dominant effect, which is the local people cannot afford it, you know, because, because of that, uh, you know, uh, I'm a homeowner, I want to get the maximum price for my, you know, for my house, and I know that the market is, is getting healthy, you know, so I'd be able to get a maximum price for the house that I'm living now, which is probably an old house. Now, I guess if the, uh, some of these homeowners, if they give up their old homes to, to move up to Kaka'ako or some of these new developments, then they'll free up the, the old homes, which maybe somebody can afford to buy. But the problem is some of these old homes are in prime property, prime locations like Kaimuki, you know, things like that, and Kailua, uh, Kailua you know, and those, those are high-priced property, too. Senator Lecrae, um, that how much of diversion out of the market is, a, is an issue? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, you know, if I knew the, if I knew the answer to that, I'd, I'd, I'd tell you, but I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I agree. With, I agree, though. There are being some. There's clearly being some housing units that are being that are being diverted out for um, for a tourist use. Um, to my mind, what's really important is for the city to get for the city and the state to get a handle on it. Um, you know, we, how, ought, how we, we ought to have a framework. Um, uh, it, it, have it, it ought to be clear what the regulation is. It ought to be. I, I, I think there, the, there is no I, mechanism for them to control it, I, which is why the vast majority. You know, in I, in in uh, Portland, they actually legalized this Airbnb thing, right. and what they uh, and in San Francisco, they just did too about four months ago, and the the trade off was we'll pay back tourist tax and stuff, and uh, and we'll create a registry and legalize it. Fifteen percent. Of those people actually legalized it. Eighty-five percent did not, even that became legal, and and that's that's an indication of what we're seeing here is is illegal shadow hotel corporations in essence hiding behind you know, the mom and pop trying to rent out their room to save their mortgage. Okay. you know, so we're we're let's, seeing let's, that here let, and elsewhere. Let, let's not go too far into the uh, B and B thing because I think that uh, we, we've got a lot of things yeah. to talk about. And and I, what I'd like to kind of get into, and uh, Carrie, maybe you could you could help us with this is the the actual strategies that families are using um, is the equity in their home very often what they're using to take care of their children uh, it, are, are you seeing tactics like that do you talk to folks about that some but many of them don't even own a home right so when we talk about intergenerational change what are some of the tools that we're giving families in terms of resources in terms of savings in terms of financial literacy in order to then make the decision of what college they're going to attend and then how they are going to live in the career that they've selected. So we point out the realities of what's happening so that they can make an informed decision about that. You know, let me, uh, a quick question from our viewers. This might take us a little bit off track, but I wanted to talk a little bit about overall cost of living impacts. And I got a couple of questions from people saying, you know, Hawaii is highly taxed. Is it the taxes, the excise tax on food and drugs and housing, uh, as opposed to other places that exempt that? Um, Eric, what do you think? Do you think the taxes are a significant driver of our cost of living? Look, I, our, our, our economy has been skewed for many years. You know, Hawaii used to be, under the kingdom, it used to be self-reliant for food. It was a food exporter. We exported millions of pounds of rice around the Pacific Basin. Uh, that, was, that was done away with. You know, we became a two-crop economy for sugar and pine, producing, you know, sugar and pine for outside market. And, and our local self-reliant agriculture has been, you know, destroyed. And, on, and since the withdrawal of the plantations, you know, many of those uh, plantation lands have been developed for other purposes other than agriculture. So we still are importing 95% of our food. It's being grown in California and Chile and all over the place, and we're, we're paying the high cost. But it's also a monopoly cost because there's no way that for local produce to compete with, you know, produce coming out of Imperial Valley or other places, uh, big, big agribusiness and stuff. So we, we have a, a problem on the food supply uh, because it's all imported and because it's monopoly. 
monopolize. We have a problem in housing because we're competing with outside investors who, you know, can't make money on stocks and bonds, so they want a piece of uh, Hawaii. We're competing. Uh, we, we need control over our own economy in order to have a rational development uh, of our economy and our future. And so just so I understand, though, so you're saying that you don't think the taxes themselves is the issue because it's all these other bigger factors that are much bigger. Well, everybody complains about taxes. I don't know that we're, you know, I don't know that it's any more taxed living in Oahu than in Manhattan, for example. Uh, but you know, the the the, re the reality is the economy isn't driven by taxes. The economy is driven by supply and demand. And if we are not, if our supply is expensive and our demand is high, we're going to have pay a high high cost. So, Senator Lacroix, is that a fair uh, estimation? I mean, do you think taxes are a, a significant factor at all? No, I don't. I I, I think that the the four and a half percent excise tax here. Uh, the four and a half percent general excise tax is uh, um, is not excessive. There are places where pyramids, and again, the state constantly needs to be looking at where does the excise tax pyramid, uh, where where you you find that a vendor is selling to one vendor, the four and a half percent is being charged. Um, it's then charged again at the at by the final seller and it ends up pyramiding to a larger level. The state constantly has to keep looking at that to make sure the tax doesn't pyramid. But the best tax is one that's relatively low and that's assessed on a broad number of people. And if what we find, for example, is that the tax is regressive for relatively low income people, the state should be refunding it via the income tax. You know, we had that for a long time. Uh, we need to, we need to, uh, we always need to be looking at, at whether or not, whether or not lower income people are bearing too much of, of the excise tax. But I don't think that, I don't think the, I don't think the taxes are what's um, are what's driving the economy here. Okay, let's shift a little bit now to the actual the other side of the coin is the salary side. Hmm. We, we've talked about how they haven't kept up and so on. Uh, Kerry uh, Larger, you sound like you're saying that we shouldn't be so hopeless about that. That actually, if given the right help, people can identify and and get to a higher level of of earnings. Are you pretty confident about that? Yes. I I really believe in the preparation piece of uh, encouraging families to know the realities of what they're looking at, but you can achieve the career that you want with the salary that you want. It'll take time. So, so. give me a very specific example. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Like how can a person, let's say they, their parents are high school graduates, they, they're renting their house and this, this person's about to graduate. I mean, how can you help that person who economically and by, based on statistics is not going to excel much past their parents to get a job where they can afford a $700,000 house? But in that situation, I'll talk for many of the families that, that we speak to that intergenerational change again, it's all about preparing them at a younger age because you're not going to graduate and then try to figure out that plan. You have to start very early to look at the resources that are available for that particular student, particularly if you have a lot of need. When I say need in terms of financial need, there's a lot of resources, both federal, state, uh, benevolent donors that can get that second generation uh, student or first generation student basically into college and make the kind of salary. But what we look at is salary is important, but we look at where their passions lie and connect it to the career. So salary is an important piece, but that that student will not be happy if we don't connect their interests with the career. And salary is, is very important too, but it's a combination of all those things that empowers the student to do what they want to do. You know, we, we have two educators sitting right here, and I mean, education is absolutely critical for the next generation. If we're really gonna talk about people making it in Hawaii, part of it is to make sure that you think carefully about your education. If you're, if you're a high school student or a college student, um, or someone in your 20s and 30s, education doesn't end when you, when you graduate from college. It's really a lifelong endeavor. And you know, we have some really good schools here in Hawaii, and we're making them better. I mean, uh, one, can, one can talk about the ups and downs of educational reform, but there are many of us who look at it and see, and see improvements being made, whether it's in the private schools or in the public schools, or at the really great research university that we have here in Hawaii, okay, the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This is um, a really this is a really good university, and in the future, there's the potential there is a potential for the University of Hawaii at Manoa to be driving a more uh, a more research tech based economy here. And I, I think you know I just don't want this discussion to mire down in a pessimistic note. Right, I, I, I think I, there is I, a note of optimism. There's, there's a potential for 
a really good economy in the future. We're going to come back and explore this some more. I just have to take a quick break and remind our listeners that tonight we're discussing whether our children will ever be able to afford to live in Hawaii. Please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments. Call 973-1000 if you live on Oahu or 800-238-4847 if you're on a neighbor island. And let me actually just shift this to Jack Legal. The kinds of young people, I'm sure you meet young people all the time who are coming in and saying, we're ready to buy a house. What kind of jobs do they have? And what kind of fields are you seeing where people are succeeding and able to buy those houses when they're young? Uh, most of them like, um, you know, the work in um, service, uh, service jobs, you know, hotels, um, construction, things like that. And um, so a lot of times you don't really have a lot of uh, savings. And that's why I go back to the, uh, what I said before, that their parents need to help at the very beginning, either with down payment or co-signing in the loan, you know. And uh, because, the, again, the, the price of, of housing is just too much for these young people. Now, there was about two weeks ago, there was a, an article on Advertiser about this young man, about 30 years old, and he has two degrees, Bachelor of Arts degree on, uh, on uh, web, web, uh, web, web, web design, web designing and things mm -hmm. like that. He's going to San Francisco, and he bought a one-week ticket to San Francisco. And uh, so what it does, it really <clears throat> begs the question, like, we're not just losing intellectual asset to help the state, we're also losing in a very real way potential taxpayers. You know. I see Eric nodding in agreement. What, yeah. what do you see? You know, my, my members, m most of my members come from other countries. And they come here to build a life and a foundation and, and build a, a future for their families. And we're big, big believers in education. And it's, and uh, with all due respect, you get them into college, those student loans are crushing. Mm -hmm. They're crushing. I've I've lost I've lost staff members. I can't pay them enough uh, to to live here and pay off their student loans, and they move off to the mainland, and all of a sudden they're they're paying off their loans. You know, uh, the 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 cost of education is unconscionable, and uh, this community has lost its commitment to providing good you know good quality and affordable education for working people. But it's working people that pay the taxes to to drive it. So we've been upset with you know the attack on public school teachers you know forcing them to take rollbacks it's unconscionable and uh, you know tuition hikes at the UH I believe in UH uh, but if, if it's unaffordable or, or if you have to mortgage your future in order to to get the education how do you also have money to buy a house, house and then assume yeah. that mortgage yeah. so so we have to as a community we have to make a decision at some point if we want our kids to have a future here we have to make it possible for them to do that and in terms of creating enough high high paid jobs you need more money into the economy you know the way to create more high paid jobs is just you know put more money spending money in the economy so businesses can can grow and, and the, the money will go back that's what we do for the economy we we get you know right now thirty dollars an hour total package out of these hotels and and uh, that money goes straight into the economy. The money that is paid to workers by the hotel industry goes straight into the economy. And if we don't get it, it won't stay here. They buy that hotel. They'll sell that hotel. They'll go off to Wall Street and do do another deal, and um, and and that money will be gone. So, what we need to do is we need to fix more spending power into our economy to create more business opportunities, not just in hotels, but the hotels are what we got. Yeah. That's the jobs we got. We need to make them good paying, and we will do that. We need to be able to represent those workers to be able to do it. Okay, now, this is a great call. We have heard about the problems from the panel. Can we hear their suggestions for how to make Hawaii more affordable for our children? I hear what you're saying, Eric, is that essentially let's get the workers' salaries up higher so that they can invest in the economy. Senator LaCroix, is what, he, is what Eric's been saying correct in that, in that sense? Well, you know, one place I think we need to take a close look at reform is with the Jones Act. The Jones Act is really a multifaceted piece of legislation. It regulates shipping from the U.S. mainland to Hawaii. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think we've, there's, there's one part of it that if we changed would really help Hawaii a lot, and that's the requirement to use U.S. ships. Um, the requirement to U.S. ships is a big, imposes big capital costs on the industry. 
Um, a lot of these, a lot of the, a lot of the shippers to Hawaii are are, think, are need to replace their ships. Uh, the capital costs are enormous. Um, the idea that there's, we, we don't have to allow foreign competition um, into the trade. We don't have to allow non-U.S. workers to to be on the ships. We don't have to allow foreign flag ships to be there. But if we if we merely move toward toward using foreign ships, and the U.S. no longer has a comparative advantage in building ships, uh, if we use foreign ships, that would that would I think help to help to uh, um, help to reduce the cost of shipping things to Hawaii. Uh, would help to reduce the cost of living, and at the same time, it wouldn't impair the jobs of of the workers who are who are in that industry. Very larger. Let me ask you. Um, you were you starting to talk about some of the um, exciting careers that that may be ahead. What where what are the general career fields where you're seeing growth? People are getting jobs. Well, health is a big uh, industry as well. Uh, you know, I, I think about uh, what Jack said about that that student or that mm, person with yeah. two degrees. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the things to help uh, that particular person is we look at internship opportunities when we look at a lot of the the local companies and having our local students competitive for the jobs out there it's the experiences that we give to them to be marketable internships uh, networking with professionals that's really helping to um, get our students to to be able to get those kinds of salaries. I think it's experience because we've talked to employers and they said there's a skill gap. So we think, okay, what is the skill gap that they see? It's not having the experience that they need, not connecting to those kinds of 21st century skills, working with people, teamwork, collaboration. Those soft skills we have to build in our, in our local uh, students to be able to, to be marketable and to know that you're competing with many across the nation who wants to come here, but how do we empower our students or our families uh, who are local to stay here? It's all of those connections, and I go back to preparation and resources. That will help. And, and I look at myself as a, as a first generation, uh, so I'm speaking from experience as well in terms of going to college, going away to the mainland, coming back and living the life that I want to. So I know that it can happen. You know, uh, Senator LaCroix, uh, you were trying to remind us that we have a great opportunity here in Hawaii, you know, and uh, and uh, taking from what Eric said about the, 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 the debt that people come, is it a myth that you need to send your kids to the mainland to go to college? Uh, and perhaps that they, if they come back, they've got sixty or seventy thousand dollars worth of debt. Is 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 it smarter to send your kid to Hawaii, UH, have less debt, and have the same? Do you think the kids have the same opportunity? You know, I think it really depends upon the particular person involved. Um, you know, if someone has the opportunity to go to Stanford, there's a lot to be said to going to Stanford. Um, UH Manoa is a really good school. The, there's other schools in the in the UH system. That are that are really fine schools for people who get an excellent, an excellent education. Um, that's really to be remembered. Just that 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 we have some world class researchers at UH Manoa. Um, it, it, it's it's a school where you can get an excellent education, and you know uh, all, all students in Hawaii ought, ought, to, ought to take a close look um, at the university. We, we we really do things well. I think one of the problems the university has had is is we've had some we've we've had some management problems over the last few years. The media has focused on that. And yet, when you look at the university over the last over the last 30 years, the amount of research dollars we're bringing in has just skyrocketed. Uh, we become a big research university. Uh, we bring a lot of money into the state. Um, the the quality of the faculty has gone up enormously over the last 30 years. Um, this has really become a very a very high quality school. And I, I think I, I think what's happening is we're losing track of. We're just kind of losing track of the fact that we have a great university in Manoa, and we're, we're looking at some of the management difficulties. And there have been some management difficulties. I think we're getting beyond that. Um, regardless of all the problems we had with the firing of the chancellor over the summer and whatever, uh, mm -hmm. the new chancellor is, is a person that we highly respect. Um, I think we're moving on from all this. And, and really I, I, yeah. I see a great future for no, you. No, and, and I do too yeah. as well because it's all about college fit. Are you going to? put a second mortgage on your home when you can get an education here. And you have to look four years out, not just how am I going to right. pay for this year. It's looking at college fit over the course of four years. And I go back to what I said about planning. And UH, yes, we have community college, we have UH, we have the different private schools here that are affordable. And it's affordable because there are scholarships as well. So if you prepare early, there are merit scholarships and need-based scholarships too. So 
there's a there's a whole plethora of resources, and college but is affordable. I think, uh, going back to what Eric was saying, is um, these people go to college, spend a lot of money, come back to Hawaii. Where's the job? But you don't have to spend a lot of money to you know. go away. You can get the education here as an option. And again, mm -hmm. it's about the families talking well, about. Do we have job for these uh, young people so that they will stay in Hawaii? So we look at workforce development. We yeah. look at the colleges. We look at the high schools. We look at private organizations. So how do we look together as a collaborative partnership to build exactly those jobs of the future that we don't know exist right now. There's many jobs that will be created in the future no, that we don't know about. It's not up to the state to, to create new industries, but it's really up to the state to create the foundations for new industries. You know, we talked a little bit about Kakaako tonight, and, and you know, we, we really should get back to the original purpose of Kakaako, which was really to provide to provide housing and some development that was complementary to the cancer center and, 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 and to the medical school. Regardless of some of the current problems that those, that those units have had, um, the future of medical research is really bright. You know, even 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 if those those units have been site, have have been overbuilt and they've had their recent problems, there's going to be more medical research being done. There's going to be more NIH grants coming in the future, and we're likely to see. I think um, we're likely to see those two institutions really prosper and thrive. And and again, the original purpose of Kakako was to try to see that we could have we could have spinoffs coming out of those operations so we could have a that we could have a technology but it's, it's not center there and it's I, not I, 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 I think we're I think we're getting a diversion of what's yeah. actually happening in the community discussion away from that it'd be good if if all if all people involved yeah. refocused a bit yeah on that's some of why the original I think purposes. I think we're, we're losing that purpose in, in Kakako in particular because we're supposed to build like uh, different types of, uh, of uh, housing there affordable from low to medium to market properties What's driving the price is really building luxury condos in the area and losing sight of the affordable homes that need to be built in that area. Now, I guess if we follow the requirement that 30% of total units should be affordable to those earning 120% of the area median income for sale property and then develop uh, rental units they only have to, you only have to have 15% of the total units and 80% of the AMI we'll for rent. Come back. That's a good point. Yeah. Let's come back to that in a, in a minute or so, but I have buried in this <laughs> quite a large pile of cards. I was trying to find it, but basically, and, and, uh, Eric, I think, Eric Gill, I think you mentioned this. What we're both, we're all talking a little bit about greed here, is that, you know, we're talking about how we want to reform our economy, how we want to reform our housing, how we want to reform all these things, but ultimately it's about how much money, it's being driven by how much money can people make. How do we, whose job is it to control that? Let me start with you, Eric. Uh, well, that's what we do. I mean, that's what I do for a living is try to- That's why I gave get, you this question first. Get as first. much money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the fact is there's billions and billions of dollars being made here on Oahu right now. There's, there's like 30 hotels already being built on this island as we speak, many in West Oahu, mm -hmm. right? You got, you got the Kapolei one Kapolei. coming, the Kapolei the Mall, the Bartolo's putting in there. You got another one up at Coral Ridge. You got, yeah. you got the Ocean Point one. You got the Cam Drive-In one. You got, you got uh, you know, Howard Hughes is talking to me about building three hotels in Kaka'ako. You got uh, the new Ritz coming up on Kalakawa. You got that new uh, project that's being done uh, at the King's Village. That's gonna that's gonna go up. You got you got a massive amount of money being spent, and none of it is being spent in a way that would help us solve this problem. Uh, Investors all over the world are looking here, and, and you know they, if you look at the recent sell-off of those Howard Hughes buildings, mm. was it 60 percent foreign nationals? There's a lot of people in Japan, and China, and Korea that are parking their money here because you can't make it on the stocks and the bonds. It's too volatile. Currency exchange, you know. So Oahu real estate is a great investment. It doesn't lose its value. You know, if you hold it long enough, you'll be able to sell it at, at, a, at an increase. So we're we're competing with all these people who are trying to use our real estate for their purposes. And really what we have here is real estate. We don't, you know, we have a great university. We don't have a real tech industry. We don't have, we don't have uh, manufacturing. We don't have any of the basic underpinnings except real estate. And we're letting it 
we're, we're letting it be frittered away. Kakako, a great opportunity that's being lost as we speak, you know, as all this, all this land is being used to build luxury condos. Okay, Eric, uh, let me go to Jack Legal. You know, I, it's, I'm interested hearing a, 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 a real estate person argue for more affordable housing. I mean, I, it's interesting to me to hear that. Do you think that the government should step in and ensure that more affordable housing is being built, even if realtors end up making less money? I think we should, because you know why? If you, if you build a lot of different types of homes, like affordable homes, it will drive down the cost, you know. Um, if they follow the, uh, the requirement of 30% of the total units. Now, for example, I just uh, drove by um, Hawaii Kai today. Avalon is being built, uh, 7,000 Hawaii, dri Hawaii Kai Drive. 269 unit, uh, units rental. 54 of them, of those units, are affordable. The rent is from 1,400 to about 1,500. 54. And, um, as we speak, I think uh, Kalailoa is being developed, the, the BOQ. I think you've heard about this uh, in Kalailoa. The, the rentals Hunt properties. in the old former Barbers Hunt properties, Point. yeah. BOQ is uh, being turned into uh, an affordable rentals. And I just spoke with the, the guy who is uh, in charge of it. And um, it's 100 units. The rent is from 1200 to $1,400. Is that affordable? It's, uh, well, they, they say that it's according to the, uh, the HUD uh, requirements of 70% to 100% of the AMI, you know. So it's a one bedroom, you know. And, and one bedroom for $1,200? $1,200, yeah. Okay, uh, carry it larger. Let me ask you, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Eric, uh, you know, the union, the ability to collectively bargain with employers is, his, is their power. Do you think that the community collectively could somehow bargain? You were talking a lot about people working together, industry working with education. So, do you have hope that you know once we get to a certain point that we'll be able to do that? That we'll actually be able to change so that we can take care of these generations we're worried about ahead of us? I always have hope for our future generation, mm -hmm. and I think incremental change can get us to the long term rewards that we're looking for. But it will be incremental. Uh, it's not going to turn around quickly, but I believe, again, those short term that leads to uh, long term success. Senator LaCroix, uh, again, going back to the, the greed question. Mm. Uh, I, first of all, I, is that a fair question? And two, and two, is what do you think? Where is the controlling faucet on all that? Well, it's really important for the state to set some frameworks um, for development. Um, it's important that when housing is developed that we see that there's a there's an incentive to develop rental housing there's an incentive there's an incentive to develop smaller units that that would that would that would appeal to to people with lower incomes um, that's something we haven't done as much in, in this state until recently I, I noticed the city council and the mayor are, are discussing micro micro housing units they're 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 discussing um, allowing families to build um, additional units on their on their property, um, all this I think is really positive. I, the affordable housing, um, the affordable housing requirements, I think at times are a dysfunctional requirement because they're essentially a tax on the building of more housing. Um, and with the tax on the building of more housing, we have less housing being built. And so we, we focus on, you know, we, we need affordable housing. But by putting these affordable housing requirements into the into the housing development projects, we actually end up with less housing being built, and so prices skyrocket. Um, and then we focus again on the affordable housing. I think we really need to go back and ask, how can we build more housing in general? And, and how, can we, how can we change the regulatory framework so that it encourages more, it encourages more rental development, it encourages more development for, for low-income people? Um, there's all sorts of measures, I think, that the city and the state can take in that regard. They, you know, they would really help. I've gotten a number of questions uh, from viewers uh, along the line of what Jack Legal was talking about is, are there enough skilled jobs? And I'm wondering, uh, Eric Gill, do you feel that um, where do you see the economy going, where the skilled jobs will come in? Uh, one of the things that struck me was, you know, there are skilled jobs in the hotel industry. I mean, there's tech jobs, IT jobs, there's management jobs, uh, there's also, you know, engineering and so on. But I mean, do, are, do those, those are a tiny portion of it? And, and, and where do you think the growth in the economy where skilled jobs, where do you think that's going to happen? Well, we've got many members who are working in hotel because they can't 
despite their college degree, they can't find a better job outside. You know, we've delivered a, a pretty high standard. And, uh, and that's not true in many professions. You know, if you want to make money, don't be a teacher, for example. So, you know, I mean, public school teachers are leaving in droves because they can't afford to live on that salary. Uh, and, and in the hotels, you know, many of the higher-end jobs are, are not developing. They're being exported. The tech jobs are the ones you can do in India or in, you know, uh, Manila or other places. You know, we've lost many reservation jobs to, you know, the, the, because of the technology. That work is now offshore, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, technology, for example, has put food and beverage cashiers. It's an endangered species. Everybody's doing it like this now. So technology is a double-edged sword. It doesn't necessarily provide the, the the great employment, and many tech workers are. Are not organizable. They're they're basically being used as independent co contractors. They'll never be able to develop a, a a pension program or anything like that as an independent contractor. So, we if we're going to do it, we have to actually address you know labor standards and 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 I don't think that's something that a government is well equipped to do. That's what collective bargaining is about. But let me ask those Senator Lacroix. I mean, there's been talk about the living wage. You know, actually setting a living wage. I think that someone, we had a panel here where everyone agreed that the minimum wage should be $15 an hour. Um, and uh, do you think that that's a, a place where government can go or should go, or does that have unintended consequences? Well, the minimum wage. I mean, you know, I've, I've I've been in favor of the of the raising of the minimum wage on Oahu, but that's partly because we haven't done anything else. I don't think it's a great measure for the state to be doing, but that there's all sorts of other measures that ought to, that ought to be taken. Um, one one is to one is to improve education, and I, I see that happening in, in in this state. We've done we've taken lots of measures to reform education from the change in the way that we we appoint the school board rather than elect it. It, it has made the governor more responsible. We'll see. We'll see if citizens hold hold government to more responsibility there. Um, there's there's ongoing reforms in the schools that I see paying paying positive attention that I see paying positive results. Um, you know, we need to look at this more from just a minimum wage perspective. Um, the earned income tax credit is something that would help a lot of people in the state who are working. Uh, this is one of the few states that doesn't have it. I don't know why we don't have it. Um, that's something the legislature ought to enact would help a lot of working people. You know, on the other, the flip side of that, we've got a caller from Hilo. Can the impoverished in Hawaii afford to live here with all the entitlements they are given? Caller survives as they can and thinks the hardest for the middle class who don't qualify for these entitlements. Gary, I don't know that you feel qualified to, to analyze the entitlement system, but I'm just sort of curious. Do you see people going, I'd rather be unemployed than working? No, I don't see that. But I think to answer some of those questions about the middle, the middle income uh, families, mm -hmm. yes, it is a reality. And again, it's looking at those scholarships again that can help. So if you're preparing your child to be competitive, those scholarships will help those middle income families because that's, that's where uh, you're either very needy or you're in the middle where the, the access to resources become limited. So how do you prepare your child to do the best they can to be competitive for the numerous scholars, scholarships that are out there? Right. You, you know, uh, Jack Legault, here's an interesting question from Peggy and Lahaina. Uh, people 18 to 35 don't want to buy. They want to save to buy and rent in the meantime, but there is no affordable rental housing, especially in West Maui. We must get the government to mandate that builders build affordable rental housing. It, this goes a little bit past your earlier point, but it sounds like, do you think as a, as a realtor that the, the real need here is for a place you can live affordably while you save money? Because I have more, many, many questions here from people saying, build more affordable rentals. I think so. Uh, as I've mentioned before, um, the, uh, our young children, uh, young, you know, our, our young people, they need to save money to, in order to buy. Um, so if, if they rent a place or they live with their parents, they should be able to train how to save money because that's the purpose of it. Or when the parents build these ADUs, you know, additional uh, uh, room to their, to their existing homes, the kids will be able to live there and at the same time save money so that they can, you know, in the future be able to afford a home, you know. So again, it goes back to what Carrie is saying that uh, they, they need to be able to discipline themselves on, on, on the value of money, on the, on, the, on the power of savings. 
they have to have this. Uh, they, they must have this. Uh, this. Uh, this. Uh, uh, a plan, you know, in life to be able to see where they're going to be in the next 20 years and things like that. And so, saving is very important. I would agree with that. The saving is very important for our kids. Um, the way we having now is, um, you know, rental units is very important to our young people. You know. Okay. Uh, let yeah. me. We have about two minutes to go. Let me just start around circle. Let me start with you, Eric. What are the things uh, I'd like each of you to come up with? What do you think is the most hopeful thing or the most important thing for us to, to walk away from this conversation with? Well, for me, the biggest and most hopeful thing is, you know, after many years of, you know, the me generation and, you know, basically, you know, for the last 30 or 40 years, there's been very little activity in terms of people actually taking, getting involved and in taking action. And what I'm, what I'm seeing now is that's starting to change. Uh, our, our kids, uh, you know, my daughter just turned 30 and then she just went through some experiences. Dad, now I understand what you, what you, what you're talking about. What we're, what we're seeing is, is young people actually starting to realize that they actually have to do something. And I think that will uh, be the force that really helps us move. If we have a, a people, if get people involved. actually get involved and get organized and, and do things, uh, we I've will, will be able to stop you now. But, and I'm going to stop everybody. Sorry about that. But uh, I think that what you're saying is something that everyone here yeah. will probably agree with. I think so. Now, for our next show, state lawmakers are debating whether a medical marijuana dispensary system would meet the needs of patients who use pharmaceutical grade cannabis or if it would make the drug too accessible to children and recreational users. When Will, when will Hawaii's patients be able to buy medical marijuana? That's the next time on Insights. On PBS Hawaii, I'm Daryl Huff, Ahui Ho.